Okay, everybody ready to study the word, yes or no? Yeah. All right, let's all pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the dedication of our sweet little sister. We thank you for that whole family that will raise those two little girls so beautifully. Father, we thank you that our responsibility is to uh, do all we can to shield our families and our children in prayer and in love and in provision and everything that we can do to make life better for one another. And of course, one of those things is to grow in your word and study your word. So we ask you to teach us right now and, and look into the word of God and have you speak personally to every one of us. Heavenly Father, remove me from the equation as much as possible and just speak through me this morning because you're the one who breathed this letter that we'll be studying. You're the one who knows the ideas you want emphasized over the next few minutes. And so, Heavenly Father, we all humbly submit to you, asking you to teach us and train us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We are in 2 Timothy this morning. 2 Timothy, the first chapter. And this morning we're going to be talking about priorities and patterns. Priorities and patterns. This is Timothy's last letter. He wrote this letter while Nero was emperor, and Nero was in the process of eliminating the Christians and blaming the Christians for horrific things that many historians think he wrote. Nero himself was doing atrocities in the city, then blaming the Christians in order to have an excuse to uh, persecute them and hurt them. Timothy was in a Roman prison at the time he wrote this. I'm sorry, Paul was in the prison uh, in Rome at the time he wrote this letter. This is his last letter. And um, he wrote it to Timothy. Now, Timothy came to Christ when he was 16 years old. And... Uh, Timothy is referred to on multiple occasions throughout Paul's letters. Um, Paul refers to him in a variety of ways, always warmly. Uh, he calls him his dear son. He calls him his faithful co-worker. He refers to him always in a, in a very affectionate, endearing way. And you're going to see that in this chapter. Paul really loves Timothy, and so Timothy came to Christ uh, with some of his family members when he was 16, and they think uh, this letter was written about 14 years after that encounter, so at the time of this writing, Paul is an older man, and Timothy's probably uh, 30 years old or something like that, and I can, I can verify that as you get into my age group, I meet a 30-year-old grown man with a family, and Everything's wonderful in their life, and I'll see him as a young man, as a young Timothy. And um, that, that's, the, that's the way this works. And so, so here, Paul probably knew he was going to be killed soon, which he was. Paul knew that he wanted to write this letter to someone that he deeply loved and trusted. And I want you to kind of see that affectionate relationship and the importance of it because our society has distorted those types of relationships so much. Very often, either the young men or the older men are cautious about those types of relationships. And I think it's important to keep relationships focused on the gospel and intentional and uh, and constructive, and I think it's important for you older guys to essentially have apprentices in life, younger men in your life that will follow you like you follow Christ, or that will pattern their life after you, or can safely establish the same priorities that you have. Because when you establish priorities, then, then these younger, for you men, it would be younger men. For you women, it would be younger women. Then they learn from that, and they, they can pick up on those priorities. And I know we're living in a culture where the older guys and the older gals are kind of afraid of that. But I can tell you, many of the divorces occur in our generation because the older women are not teaching the younger women how to love their husbands like they could. 
But you women that have learned how to love, I tell you, it's a learned skill to love these guys. And that's why the Bible encourages the older women to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. And there are some women that go all the way through life and they never figure out how to love their husbands. And the older women that have figured that out need to have younger apprentices as they're coaching how to have a, a life with their spouse and how to enjoy one another and grow with one another and those types of things. I guarantee you, your local university will not effectively teach that. And I guarantee you, the Discovery Channel will not effectively teach that. And our society, less and less, will teach how to have wholesome, healthy relationships so that the young men can look at some older men and figure out how to have priorities in life, how to have direction in life, how to have patterns in their life so they can be okay. So they can get later on in their years and not have so many regrets and not have such um, disasters in the wake of their life. And so that is the principle of eldership. Eldership, it's very interesting right now because because looking at the principle of eldership, it's elders are men and women in a church that have figured out how to live life well. doesn't mean their whole life has been perfect by any means. It means they figured out how to live life well, and in their lives become a pattern for the church. Okay? The same way with families. The older people, I, I, I grew up near an Amish community, and it, the Royers were the major uh, family there, and in their central farmhouse, there were typically four generations. There were some kids around, then some young moms and dads around, grandparents around, great-grandparents around, and they would farm together, they'd work together, they'd have their meals together, and those young men and women had opportunities to learn about life and godliness that many in today's culture don't get. And so they didn't deal with many of the things that we deal with on a regular basis. And so no matter what your age is, there are always younger people that you can model life for. And so don't despise the fact if you're a young man or a young woman in this room today, you can model life and you can learn life and you can become more effective at life. And so that's why Timothy wrote this letter. Timothy was at the end, I'm sorry, that's why Paul wrote this letter. Paul was at the end of his life, he knew it. He wasn't at the end of his natural life, he knew Nero was going to have him killed. All right, and he was in prison, he was in trouble, and he knew that people were going to respond to him in a variety of different ways. Now, here's what happened. Because he went to prison, and because of the rumors spread about him throughout uh, that part of the world, most of his friends abandoned him. And so he was in a very, very difficult position where he was probably starving, where he was not being taken care of, he was not being respected, he was with the common criminals of the day, but Tim and Timothy was still in Ephesus, but Timothy was still supportive of him. All right, and so here Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus, and this is essentially a love letter saying, follow my pattern in life, and figure out my priorities, and even though, now think of the situation, he's in prison, in prison, going to be executed, a capital crime, uh, the accusations against him are severe, and here Paul is saying, this prison deal is not a big deal. What the big deal is, is my role in God. All right, so it establishes a priority. So let's look at this scripture. 2 Timothy, the first chapter, we'll begin with verse 1. It says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. So here he establishes, even with his dearly beloved young Timothy, that he is an apostle and he is chosen. Now, his lifestyle right then in a prison in such a horrible condition wouldn't communicate that. He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have public prestige. He was being maligned in the churches all over Asia. 
And here he says, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. Now, an apostle of Christ, Jesus. Now, that says something to us. I think very, very often, because older men have lived life and know of their own failures, very often we lack confidence to say something firm to a younger man. We got to get over that. The blood of Jesus washes our sins away. And we're called and we're chosen. And our young men need to be able to hear our voice. And our young men need to be able to, be, to, be, to respond to the calling that's on our life and the purpose that's on our life. The idea of respecting another and honoring another is fundamental. And the young men need to see us older men showing respect and honor, being appropriate as life uh, goes on so that we establish priorities in their minds so as they go through life, they have priorities. I've enjoyed writing blogs and teaching during this time of uh, deep political schism in America because if you keep your priorities right, people can be in all types of emotional conditions and you can stay steady and you can model staying steadily steady. Why or how? Because you're focused on the kingdom of God. Certainly you're a citizen of the United States and that is important, but it's not of primary importance. Of primary importance is the fact that you are a citizen of heaven and you are here on the earth for a while. And when young people see that and they see, oh, this is going on politically and you're not disturbed. Oh, this is going on on television and you're not all upset and all unraveled. Then they'll try to figure out why isn't, why, why don't you need drugs to cope? Why don't you need those things? And you can establish in their minds, the kingdom of heaven is real. And the power of God is real. And the calling of God is real. And that is important. And nations will come and go. Politicians will come and go. Political trends will come and go here on the earth. And those are important. We need to participate in them. And at the same time, we need to know the priority is the kingdom of heaven. And the priority is what Christ has come to do because that will be the same whether you're living in 1,000 or 2,018 or 3,000 should Jesus tarry. So here he starts off, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Jesus Christ. There he establishes, I am living for the gospel. I am... Um, all of you know about the young man that uh, went to the island that is isolated in order to share the gospel with them, and he was killed by the nationals. All of you have heard about that on the news. What's interesting to me is the way people are commenting on that, because we Christians understand the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We understand there are risks with that. We understand there are all kinds of issues with that. And there always have been in the history of the church. There have always been issues with people going to other places in the world and sharing the fact that God sent his son to redeem us from our own sins and from the curse of the law. Every culture on the face of the earth has a redemptive story in it. And very often, our missionaries just go, they learn from the nationals uh, what that redemptive story is, then they add names to it. They say, well, God is real, and he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to be sacrificed so you don't have to sacrifice anymore. You don't have to sacrifice animals or people anymore. Because Jesus is the sacrifice, and then that changes people's hearts, changes their lives, and it's a wonderful, wonderful development that goes on. That is a major priority. That is more important than staying alive. And so this young man gave his life, and it's so interesting to watch people from various perspectives trying to comment and second-guess that young man. But have you noticed his mom and dad aren't second-guessing him? His mom and dad are saying he wanted to be buried on an island if this ever happens, to, or he wanted to be buried if he's ever killed, uh, spreading the gospel. He wanted to be buried right there. Don't retrieve his body. Don't punish any people for taking him out there. He's the one who wanted to do this. Let his body be buried there. Let his life be a sacrifice for the future salvation of the people on that island. And see, we understand that because we understand the kingdom of heaven is important. So when we understand the kingdom of heaven is important, that puts our business into perspective. 
That puts our family relationships into perspective. That puts why we have savings accounts and why we have cars for transportation and why we are members of the body of Christ and participating in the body of Christ. All of it comes in perspective when we understand heaven is real and heaven is eternity. And while we're here on the earth, our 70 years plus or minus a few, that's where we make decisions about eternity and priorities. So here he says, um, I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, and then notice the affection here, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, that means favor, mercy, that means never make you pay for the failures that you have in your life. Grace means you get good things. Mercy means you're not going to get the bad things that you deserve. All right. And peace. That means you don't have to up your medications. Okay. So here, then he starts in. Timothy, I thank God for you. All right. That right there. To say that to younger people than you. I thank God for you. You are a blessing to my life. And let me tell you something, everybody. You know, in Jewish tradition, those that are practicing Jews, when they're be going into the Sabbath on Friday night, their Sabbath meal on Friday nights, they bless their children. And what their children hear every week after every week after every week is how they thank God for them and they bless them. And see, I think that is so important for us to communicate. Here, Paul says, I thank God for you. And the God I serve with a clear conscience. Here he's, here he's teaching priorities. He's not saying, you know, I'm a sinner and I know you are too and we'll just have to get through it. He's saying, no, I have a clear conscience about my life and you can too. I thank God for you. The God who we serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. So this is a long thing. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Just the idea of younger people knowing that we pray for them. Just the idea of younger people knowing that we are for them, that we thank God for them, and we're proud of them. It's a powerful, powerful thing. In verse 4, it says, I long to see you again. He doesn't say, hey, I'll see you someday, buddy. Catch you later. He says, I long to see you again. He's communicating a heart of longing to be with Timothy, the younger man. I thoroughly enjoy you. You are faithful to me. You are a co-worker with me. You've stayed with me. Even when everybody else abandoned me, I love you deeply. I pray for you. I am so proud of you, and I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. Some of you might know who Chris Hodges is. He was here for seven years and helped us with music and youth when we were building New Life Church. He was out of our youth group. Gail and I pastored him when he was in high school and college. And, the, and now he pastors the largest church in America. All right. And so he's done very, very well in life. But I remember when Gail and I were in a U-Haul truck, we were 25, 6, 7, 27 years old in a U-Haul truck, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, with all of our stuff in it. And Chris came pulling up, spinning up in his car, and he draped over the door of that U-Haul truck and sobbed as we were getting ready to pull out of town. That so deeply impacted me. And now, decades later, it is not surprising at all to me that he is the local church senior pastor of the largest church in America. He loves the scriptures. He loves relationships. He loves missions, he loves the kingdom of God, and he loves people. He has a clear conscience, and he loves people who have a clear conscience and have gotten to that place, so they're free to love, they're free to share, they're free to pray, they're free to grow, they're not obsessed with sin, they're obsessed with the kingdom. They're not obsessed with failures, they're obsessed with God's vision and God's life. And this set of priorities, see, it can only come by watching people that do it. 
It can only come because our world is so negative. They're going to highlight. Somebody can live a wonderful, wonderful series of years, and there will be somebody that's going to pick them apart and hurt them. You remember the, um, the, when Barbara Bush died? And Barbara Bush, I mean, gee whiz, what a wonderful lady. And, but there were some who just insisted on calling her names. And I think if we don't prioritize for our young men and women, and by the way, this applies to every, everyone. I mean, if you're seven years old, you're going to be able to influence a four-year-old. And so, so he, here when he says this, I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. What wonderful things to write a young man. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Now, everybody, listen to me. This is a big idea. I believe that we should have family relationships when possible. Okay, that means, and I learned this from my parents. If my parents were friends with other parents, then my parents were automatically friends with their kids and grandkids. And so you have these family ties where you love one another. Okay, last, can I tell this story? I'll, I won't tell much, but Linda was here with her daughter last week. Because I love Linda and Ski, I automatically loved her daughter. And so I loved her. And then I tracked down her m number Monday morning, called her, talked with her, prayed for her through the week. I don't know her, but I know her mom. And since I know her mom, I love her. And also, I know two of her sons. All right? And so because, because I know Linda and Ski, when Linda would bring the two grandchildren around, boom, as far as I'm concerned, they can have what they want. And I'm going to give them special attention when they come to the men's meeting. I'm going to call them out by, when I say call them out by name, I don't mean negatively. I'm going to recognize them when, they're, when they walk in the room and treat them with respect. See, and it's, it's because of this idea of a family relationship. Here said the Selvics, they, when our kids were growing up, they lived in the house across the woods from our house. So they saved our children's lives multiple times. Okay, but as the years go by, their kids have grown up, our kids have grown up, but when I run into their kids, I love them. I'm committed to them, and I'd do anything for them, just as if I was in touch with them every week. Why? Because I know their mom and dad. And so the Haggards love the Selvigs, the Selvigs love the Haggards, and it doesn't have to be maintained. It just is. You see this idea? Here says Randy Welsh. Randy Welsh, we've known one another forever. One of his boys was one on my lighting crew back at New Life when we had a lighting crew. How do you like our lighting crew now? <laughs> and so, so his kids are going through their stages. My kids are going through their stages. We're just committed to each other's kids. And there may be a 10 or 20 year gap in some of that. But still, when you have that kind of a family tie, there is something to that. Don's back here. He's got a grandson that's a little too exciting, and it's affected your family too. So all three of us, we're all connected because of that grandson, and we love him most of the time. See, it's these, and see, if, if kids have to earn, oh, like Jeff and Pam, we've known one another for a long time, and so because of that, I like your family. See, and, and, and see, see how that, that works. Same with the paces. And it, I could go through this room and just say, oh man, that, that, this is the way it works. And here Paul is talking about that. But see, we're too individually focused in this generation to let that individuality is important, but it can't dominate everything. Our families are families for a reason, and for our children to be as secure as they need to be, even as they go through the decades, they need to know there's a family friend. They need to know there's security, even in, in an old pastor, or an, old, or an uncle, or a neighbor, or whatever. There's security in that, and that is more secure than maintaining everything all the time like, uh, like two kids in high school. Does that make sense? Alex's mom and dad 
were at New Life when Alex's dad was out here at the Army base. Gail and I were speaking in New York, and his mom and dad were sitting to the right second row in every service. Then the years pass, Alex comes along, and Alex can have whatever he wants because we know his mom and dad. So we didn't just meet Alex a couple years ago. We, Alex has been around, and Aaron knew Alex because Aaron was the children's pastor when Alex was a little boy. So Alex was running around stealing candy, and Aaron was the old man. He was 17 years old. You see how this works, everybody? This is a very important dynamic that the Apostle Paul is communicating here. He says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith, faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. You see, he's not criticizing his family. He's not an expert on the other family's sins. He's building them up. All right? This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Do you see that, everybody? It could be that little girl that we just prayed over this morning. I may run into her when she's 16 years old and I'm sitting in the mall waiting for Gail to come and find me. <laughs> She'll come up and remind me who she is and I'll say, I laid hands on you 16 years ago when you were a baby. If you'll fan into flames those gifts, you will be blessed all your life. You hear it? See, what's that worth, everybody? Yeah, I, I, these are precious gems that are in the scriptures, but very often we overlook them because we think of Paul being so... Um, we, we just, in the 2,000 year gap, we've depersonalized a lot of this. See, instead of seeing the big ideas, the big patterns, the big principles, the priorities, he's writing his final letter and he's commenting about relatives. He's writing his final letter and he's talking about fan into flames, the gifts, when I laid my hands on you. I remember your mother. I remember your grandmother. See, these are priorities, everybody. This stuff is important. And I know we've got a bigger population now. And I know there are lots of people that come in and out of your life. And not everybody can be a priority. But some people have to be a priority. Deb was down in, where were you on that sailboat? Deb was in Florida on a sailboat showing off. And when I looked at that picture, I thought of her husband. And I believe where the Bible says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And in the exhortation from the scripture, I believe those are angels that watch over us and minister to us as there's salvation. And I also believe our, the dearly beloved departed are given permission by God from time to time to peek that they peek into our life. And those of you that have lost a loved one, you might have experienced that, where you just kind of feel like you're being watched. Okay, when I saw the picture of Deb on that sailboat, you remember my response? I said, Rodney's watching you and smiling. I said, he is very pleased with you right now. And this is a wonderful blessing. Okay, think of Deb had taken off and wasn't around anybody that ever knew Rodney. Started a different life. Some therapists say one of, the number, one of the great contributions to depression in our generation is that people fragment their life. They don't connect their life. They don't connect the dots, one dot after another, and build relationships. But you see, I knew about Rodney. So when I saw the picture, I, I didn't care about the sailboat so much. I didn't care about the place. I didn't even know where it was, or nor do I care. What I cared about was that Deb was there, and I thought Rodney was peeking. Someone needs... Jealous. He's jealous of you, you think? <laughs> you still think that. You just... 
You'll eventually figure out what I'm saying here. <laughs> this is really important, everybody. This, this, this idea of connectivity, we were talking back here to the godfather and the godmother about that little girl. And I was telling them, this isn't just for a church ceremony or anything. We were talking about the roles as the years go by to bring that little girl additional security so she can be okay on her first day of college. And so she can be okay when the first time a guy is trying to be overly nasty with her and she has a, an emotional time and she may or may not want to talk to mom and dad and grandpa and grandma, but she's got to be able to talk to God, Godmother. Because Godmother's the one that's been praying steadily for her. See, and then Godmother will strengthen what mom's been saying and what dad's been saying. And in that little girl, after going through a traumatic experience that night with her date, she's safe. See, this is about life, being okay as you go through life. And Paul is communicating that where he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. In other words, man up, stand up. Be people. Be firmly in relationships that are constructive. God's not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, 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 love, love, and self-discipline. It's interesting. Other translations translate this exact same Greek phrase as sound mind. Back in the old days, we used to say people had a sound mind or people had a weak mind. When we don't use those terms anymore, but when we referred to a weak-minded person, it was somebody that couldn't think clearly or somebody that couldn't follow through or somebody that couldn't keep their own word, somebody that had a weak mind. It was, it was cogn cognitive inability, a cognitive dysfunction many times. Okay, but here he's saying... God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, but a power, love, and a sound mind or self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. In other words, don't, don't be afraid. Never be ashamed. And don't be ashamed of me either. Okay, think of that. Guy writing from prison to the young man. He says, don't be ashamed of the gospel and don't you be ashamed of me. Actually, I could say that for those of you that are tormented by people that are obsessed on my scandal 12 years ago. Don't you be ashamed of the gospel, and don't you be ashamed of me. See, just, just stand up strong with it. Stand up strong with it. You believe the gospel. I believe the gospel. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're redeemed. I'm redeemed. You're growing in holiness and righteousness. I'm growing in holiness and righteousness. Let's do this with confidence. Okay? And let, let other people obsess all they want to obsess, but let's do this right. Come on, everybody. All right, so here it says, hey, don't, don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. Think of this to a young man. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer. Boy, that's different than the TV guys are saying. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plan to us. I'm sorry. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death. He illuminated the way of life and immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher. God chose me to be an apostle. God chose me to be a teacher of this good news. He's writing this in a jail cell, starving and cold. This is why I'm suffering here in prison. See, all right, everybody, see the priorities? He is not obsessed with the prison thing. He's obsessed with the calling. That's the great priority. He's not obsessed with, is Timothy not going to like me anymore? He is being a leader. He is modeling how to go through difficult times in life and keep your priorities. Have a pattern in life. And he says, but I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. 
And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. In other words, God's God, I am not God. God can do it. God's in charge. God's almighty. So, our final verse for today. Hold on to the pattern. He's just explained the pattern. He didn't lay it out like we would. But he explained the priority of the kingdom, the priority of his purpose, the priority of his calling, all those types of things. And listen to me, everyone. Every one of you are called. Every one of you have purpose in him. Every one of you are chosen. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you have learned from me. See, he doesn't say, I hope you got a few good things. But I know life's been tough. I've been sick. You've been sick. I have a thorn in my flesh. You probably have your own problems. So don't live life the way I've lived life. I'm just a worthless, no good SOB. And I just hope you can get a little bit of good out of something we've done together. He doesn't even come close to that. Here he says, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching. You learn from me. So every one of you establish a pattern of wholesome teaching. Establish a pattern of the effectiveness of the gospel. Establish a pattern here. He says, a pattern shaped by the faith and by the love that you have in Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Amen, everybody.